How's the Korea weather? Very excellent. 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 Good city for the global intellectuals. But, uh, the condition of the city to gather the global engineers and intellectuals is for a little bit complicated. So I would like to simplify it as a two. The first one is uh, what is the uh, competitiveness of a global city? I see. Mm -hmm. Like uh, in Singapore or Dubai. Mm -hmm. And the second one is that. What is the sustainable development of competitiveness? Mm -hmm. Is the quality of life. Mm -hmm. So each one mm -hmm. uh, give, give us some five minutes speech. What is the uh, competitiveness of a global city? And what is the quality of life of a global city? Each one, mm -hmm. uh, five minutes speech. After that, we will discuss. That's it. Okay. okay. <coughs> and then, firstly, start with Professor Berry. <coughs> oh, mm -hmm. um, so you, the, you want to go first with what are the characteristics of the yeah, yeah, city, see. not the not the sustainability or the okay. right. The first three. Well, I mean, if you think about um, attracting hard work <coughs> skill, which is what everyone's trying to do now. <coughs> everyone thought, how could we re replicate um, the Silicon Valley from mm -hmm. California or the uh, whatever is the highway near Boston? Um, yeah. Uh, and. I mean, a number of countries have attempted that in various ways. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that those two things weren't organised, they happened. Mm -hmm. And they happened because of a whole set of things that um, are part of their history, uh, the institutions around them. And the very interesting thing about it, the United States, for me as someone from outside, I've lived there several times, but from outside is, um, People are willing to live in relatively small towns. Mm -hmm. They're not only big, very big cities. Mm -hmm. There are very good universities mm -hmm. um, with um, Nobel Prize winning researchers and other mm -hmm. high level researchers in a whole range of places in sometimes small university cities like Wisconsin or, um, or in Champaign-Urbana in Illinois. Whereas we tend to think, mm -hmm. how do you get something like Melbourne or um, a global city like Singapore, and you've come to do it in Dubai. Um, so it seems to me that it's it, it's built around a range of things. It's having a set of research institutions that um, are powerful, um, and that often means more than one university. It's not going to be based around a single university. Mm -hmm. you, have a, you have a multitude of universities in the area. Um, that's more true of Boston than Stanford, but it's certainly true of Melbourne. Um, where, where um, our medical research and biological science research is very strong. But then you've got to add a cultural life for the city as well. And that's, mm -hmm. if the city's, if it's a big city, it's easier to have a, um, the kind of theatre and cultural life that enriches mm -hmm. the living for, mm -hmm. for people and makes them happier to live there and see their children grow up there and, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, now, I find that readily available in Melbourne, but I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, which is just a city of 100,000 people with a university of 32,000. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it drew all the cultural things to it. Um, mm -hmm. I was back there last year, two years ago, um, for an event, and the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra had come to the United States. They played in four cities. They played in Boston, mm -hmm. in Chicago, and no, five. I think Chicago, certainly Boston and Los Angeles. And the only other two places they played were Champaign Urbana mm -hmm. and Ann Arbor, Michigan, where the University of Michigan is. Again, a small 
university town. So th there's a there's no single way of doing it. I don't think. Um, but for me, it's got to be build a strong research institutions that connect well with the rest of the society, if it's medical research with medical practice and so on, or if it's engineering technology research, it's with, it's with um, um, businesses that, that work closely with the, the institutions. And then it's, it's having the other aspects of life that attract people. I think, I think Barry, Barry is correct. I think yeah. uh, basically, basically you need you need a, a reason for a city to be there. Yeah. And I think uh, in the past, uh, the first at least the first wave of the mega cities have come about without any uh, preordination or uh, you know of a planning. You know, they, they, they happen because a confluence of factors just happens to be there. Mm -hmm. but of course, you know. People like, like us from Singapore, mm -hmm. we are uh, a little bit more concerned about our place in the world. And so we try, we try to see whether uh, we could foster uh, the, uh, the gathering of factors that will help to, make, to grow Singapore. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I think the, the, the dynamics are still not mm -hmm. settled. There are, uh, even though we've been studying this for the last 10 years, we are still not sure what brings everybody together, but in some of the, at least some of the uh, features that I think Barry described certainly must be in place. We, we, we appreciate the fact that I think the kind of cities that emerge with the new economies and so on will definitely have to be cities that have access to train people. Uh, they will have to be people, uh, cities where, uh, uh, which promises a good environment for, for living, for bringing up families, and which is one reason why <clears throat> I think a city like Hong Kong, I think in recent years, even though they've been extremely successful as a financial hub, uh, there are concerns about environmental uh, uh, pollution, uh, mm -hmm. and and that has to some extent, uh, I think, caused people to think where certain economic activity should be located in Hong Kong. But I think, uh, be that as it may, I think the the, the, the aggregation of uh, economic activities in Hong Kong is so strong. It will still grow and still grow, you know, very quickly. But for for someone like us, I suppose starting from a relatively uh, thinner slate, obviously one of the, we recognize from some of these lessons what are the things that we should not do. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we should we should be very careful about is is environment, and which is why I think you know a, a lot of a lot of places these days are paying a lot more, placing a lot more attention I think, to to preserving the you know environment. Mm -hmm. And I think people also like to be in places which are not too overwhelming. So I think uh, in a city should not should not should, should preferably offer uh, pockets of uh, uh, aggregation of, uh, of of human activity which are not too large in scale, so that it's easy for easy for a person working there or living there mm -hmm. to be able to be. Mm -hmm. I can't agree with you more. Uh, <coughs> this is, of course, we always look into uh, you know Singapore as our competitor. Uh, by the same token, they look at us as another competitor. Of course, delegations they come in from Singapore, and also we go there to learn from them as well. But you know, when it comes to the cities, of course, we have to look into the location yeah. of the city. Mm -hmm. It's strategically located. And uh, for Dubai, for example, as you take it as a case study, Dubai has been a trade hub for more than a hundred years. 100 years, 100, 150 years. Mm -hmm. That's a trade hub. And going, of course, merchants going <coughs> to India, to Yemen, mm -hmm. to yes, Africa, yes, yes. and so on. So this is one thing we always look at, the uh, location of the city where mm -hmm. it is, of course, situated. Of course, other factors will also contribute. But also location, it is quite important in this. Where Dubai now, for example, it is uh, halfway between east and west. It's mm -hmm. way. Uh, talking about the environment, and I think we agree with you, you know, uh, in order to have a sustainable development also, you have to look into ways of mitigating environmental pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about environment, I mean, we, should be, uh, we shouldn't be talking about environment, to tell you the truth, in the UAE, since we, unfortunately, the United Arab Emirates is the largest uh, carbon, where you see the largest carbon emission per capita mm -hmm. is in UAE, in the world. 
Oh, you're even yes. worse than Australia? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, where you have energy consumption, yeah. of yeah. course, you convert that into the carbon emission, yeah. mm. where we use the energy, of course, oil and natural gas, uh, no mm. coal, we don't have any coal. Mm. So this is the problem, this is the price we are paying. Mm. We are consuming our technology. We consider to be the highest energy consumer in the world per capita. Mm. So that will be translated into carbon emission. And this is now the government uh, for the past few years now have been taking, at a, taking a serious look at this issue. It's a global issue, as you are aware of, you know, so, and we are looking at it in the ways of mitigating this carbon emission. So, in order to have that sustainable development, in order to have that kind of uh, the city, a vibrant city, also you need to attract talent, knowledge workers from a mm -hmm. from elsewhere. Same as the uh, United States is doing. Attracting, of course, every year graduate students and undergraduate students, they go to uh, the United States to pursue their studies. Uh, for us, you know, Knowledge Village, I always look at Boston as a model mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, this is like an ideal model for me. Mm -hmm. uh, why Boston is like uh, considered to be an education destination? The Boston is considered to be an education destination not because they have Harvard and MIT, no. They have around 80 academic institutions yes. exactly. mm -hmm. uh, catering the needs of all the students across, I mean, all the spectrum. Mm -hmm. you, know? Mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, this yeah, one yeah. where you have full range students, mm -hmm. you know, where you have universities, tier one schools, and you have tier two schools, lower tier, so to cater the needs of the students. <coughs> so these 80 academic institutions that they have, of course, it is offering the needs of the students, and that's mm -hmm. why it's considered to be an education destination. Now, Relating that into, mm -hmm. like, of course, when you have R&D, relate that into GDP of the city, mm -hmm. gross domestic product. And you see Boston is considered to have the highest GDP among all the major cities in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I am looking into that, relating the education, being an education hub, relating that to the GDP of the city. And that's one thing we need to look at, you know, of contributing into knowledge economy. So for us, we look into Boston as an ideal model. But uh, of course, you know, the situation is quite different, you know, for us, where we have around 90% of our workforce are expatriates. Yes, but of course, we should not ignore the contribution of the expatriate knowledge workers in my city. Without uh, them, we wouldn't achieve what we have achieved. Uh, in, uh, in Dubai, we facilitate this kind of internationalization and also we unlock the potentials of these knowledge workers. They have an ideal environment for them to explore their potentials and also to produce their utmost, of course. And this way leads to creativity and innovation. Mm -hmm. Of course, creativity and innovation, we're talking about the uh, Seven Star Hotel, you are talking about uh, the, uh, the man made island, the biggest man made island, we started with that. Then, underwater hotel with the, uh, <laughs> with the ski slopes yeah. in the uh, desert, many creativity and innovation, it's all the byproduct of the, where you have the uh, knowledge workers working there in uh, Dubai. So we attract the talent and everything and we learn from them as well, but also this is where, where, where there is the uh, creativity and innovation. We have to of course facilitate that through proper uh, transparent uh, governmental laws and bylaws and regulations, mm -hmm. as well as it has to be economically viable here uh, when you, of course, come up with these initiatives and these uh, projects. Mm -hmm. So we look at the various aspects here from various angles, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other question for you. The universities and colleges and institutions is the birthplace of the mm -hmm. intellectual city. Yes. But Nowadays, the airport will be the another source of knowledge village. Mm -hmm. In case we can, uh, after uh, five years, the passengers in a year will be 100 million. That means uh, 300,000 every day. Mm -hmm. That is just the city, instant city. That means the in Seoul. good play yeah, in Seoul. Mm -hmm. But the same, and it will be the world airport will be great and great, and then that will be the good place for the uh, knowledge workers. This is a new trend, maybe. I'd like to hear from you. I, I, I think those of us in the 
in my industry, the airport industry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically are providing uh, you know, accessibility yeah. uh, to uh, to places. Um, and I think you're right. I think it's, it's going to grow exponentially for a very simple reason. If you take a country like like China, the whole the whole country, the whole country of China has a land mass the same size as the United States, <laughs> right? And yet it has a population of 1.3 billion people. Mm. Now, if you look at the United States, there are 5,300 airstrips, airports, airfields. Mm -hmm. In China, there are only 147. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they, are, they are embarking on a very ambitious program to develop a lot more airports. And it seems to me that even if they just double the number of airports, what will happen is that the, uh, the subsidiary airports, the second tier airports, will feed traffic into the mega airports like Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou. Mm. So, so this, will, this will cause these airports to grow even faster. Mm -hmm. Because previously they only served 147 airports, and if, if today their connectivity doubles, mm -hmm. we'll say 350 airports. <laughs> now that, that means that the domestic traffic itself will easily double, if not, if not mm -hmm. even, even triple. And it's, this, this scenario is being played out not only just in China, but in, I'm sure in this country as well, <laughs> as well as in India. And, but the, reason, the only reason why I cite these two large countries is because the, the growth in traffic there will have a lot of considerable impact for all of us in, in, at, at, the, you know, at, at, the, at the perimeter of, the, of these economies. And, uh, and, and, but the, the, only, the only issues, of course, is that airport, so-called airport cities are not, uh, are not real life cities in a way. Uh, people like to stay near the airport to work in the airport, but they would not like to raise their children next to an airport. Mm -hmm. They would not like to have their families there. You know? um, so I think we come back basically to the uh, to two things. Why is an airport there in the first place? Airport is there because the city is growing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the city is not growing, there is no basis mm -hmm. to have an airport there. Mm -hmm. uh, people go to Dubai because there's business in Dubai. Mm -hmm. There is. Uh, and and you're you're giving them a lot more reasons to come to Dubai, you know. Uh, so so they, so you know uh, because Dubai now serves uh, you know as, as a very important uh, financial hub. So 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 that's a that's a reason for the airport to be there. But the moment the airport is there, the airport contributes and sustains the economy in Dubai. Mm -hmm. It gives them a lot more reason for the city to grow because it it brings about connectivity to Africa to. Uh, to, to, to start to Europe, to Central Europe, and, and that, that connectivity, that accessibility from Dubai that then I mean, becomes an economic generator uh, that augments the growth of, of Dubai itself. Mm -hmm. So the original case, if you like, for airport to be anywhere is that there must be a place that, that ha some people have to fly to. Mm -hmm. But once this place achieves a certain level of momentum, then an airport and other, indeed, I think other, other intermodal forms of transport will augment that, will, will, will reinforce that growth momentum. Uh, uh, but I think, uh, I think the fundamental uh, uh, issues, I think, of any city remains that, uh, you know, where the economic generators are, mm -hmm. uh, it must be a place where people can live and bring up families. Yeah. And that, that, those are the kind of conditions that mm. I, think, I think city planners will have to strive to. Yeah, and people need to have a reason to make an attachment. Yes. Um, what are you doing now about uh, foreign workers' uh, rights to own land? <coughs> now we have this uh, process of free for property. So that starts. Yes. Because at first that didn't, wasn't the case, was it? We started with this free for properties. Uh, three years ago, maybe right. four years ago. Now it's going out of proportion almost everywhere in the city and it is uh, booming. Would you Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. no, okay. <laughs> so it is booming, of course, out of proportion. But going back to Mr. Franz's uh, point, of course, to elaborate your point, of course, uh, one of the, for Dubai, for example, we depend heavily on the transport and the logistics and uh, I'm going to make a presentation this afternoon about the, our economy, six pillars that we have, our economy that is feeding really our economy, fueling our economy. One is, of course, the transport and logistics, where we have, of course, Dubai ports uh, running the operation of 120 ports around the world. Then we have, of course, the Emirates Airlines and the airport. 
So this is one thing we also depend on very heavily. Yes. Yes. Yes, and that's not even in the home location. You're now doing that all over the place. Yes, uh, this is now, of course, when it comes to the uh, ports, yes, we are doing it uh, almost everywhere. Of course, with, uh, yeah, with the Singapore competing uh, with the position, on, uh, of course. And, but, you know, this is one thing we always look at. You know, we have to look at the other model, you know, what they implement. And, of course, we try to work and uh, exchange formation. Yes? Yeah. Well, I just need a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. As I say, you know, I'm not used to having these discussions at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> From 10 uh, countries, yes, from 10 countries. Mm. Uh, I was quite interested, I sat with the uh, professor from the U.S. a few months ago, mm. of course looking at the possibilities of having even in the U.S. Uh, in Dubai. We look at the diversification of these, uh, the nationalities mm. of these uh, institutions to reflect the diversification mm. of our population. You mentioned Singapore as a competitor of Dubai, but I think that's one perhaps aspect of our relationship. Mm -hmm. But in many ways, we we actually quite we are very very. Uh, we think you know Singapore benefited from the fact that Dubai has grown uh, so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, although it, it is sometimes uh, uh, it's sometimes painful for us to see someone thinking of thinking of ways to address solutions that we never thought of. Mm -hmm. But we, we at the same time react with a lot of admiration and uh, 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 and we use that as a source for motivation, you know, to motivate our people to come up with, mm -hmm. uh, with ideas that we have they never even dared to think of previously. You know? mm -hmm. So so while while it was true to some extent cities do compare. Mm -hmm. But I think I think you know, I think these second tier cities, as, as they grow, there's also a, a kind of symbiotic relationship because you do feed on each other. Mm -hmm. and for example, you know, I mean, in Singapore, we probably, probably if we look at uh, our institutions and, uh, and the companies, uh, practically one would say that the number of companies with ties now in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, has grown you know, uh, disproportionately, I think, to the, to the growth of the economy. Mm -hmm. we, you know, perhaps 10 years ago, maybe, you know, the, the number of companies and, and, and entities with, with ties in, in that part of the world may be about, uh, say, about 2,000 to 3,000 companies. But today we are talking far in excess of 30,000 companies. So that's, that's the kind of positive uh, reinforcement that one sees I think when we uh, you know, when, we, when we relate to a, to a, you know uh, to another city. Yeah. <coughs> oh, it's interesting you thinking about the two of you in a sense uh, not not the two of you but the, the two places. Mm -hmm. Singapore in the mid 1960s when it separated from Malaysia um, mm -hmm. was a relatively poor country, wasn't it? Yes. Um, <coughs> It didn't have oil. I mean, you're, in a way, what you're trying to do is to say, what can we do in addition to having all this source of wealth? You had to start from nothing, yeah, um, and and put a, such a strong. It's an amazing change, actually. And Korea is very much the same. Yes. In the mid 1960s, Korea had a GDP per capita the same as Afghanistan, mm. and behind every country of Latin America, mm -hmm. and it's now in the OECD. It's about 20. 22nd or 23rd in the OECD in, in GDP per capita. It's been an extraordinary transformation and it's, <coughs> it's there's a very strong education base to that development just as there was for yours. I, I know there's the, somebody want, you know, told me recently that uh, the, best, uh, the best service that economists could do to a country is to write the country off. And that was exactly what happened I think in in the 50s and the 60s, when you were asked to choose which countries in the in Southeast Asia 
are likely to follow in the footsteps. In those days, I think, I guess, you know, there's some Latin American economists like the Argentina and some were, were taught to be closest to the, uh, you know, to reaching, you know, developed country status. You know. And, and, and I think Singapore was not even a radar screen. Yeah. So, so I think that, yeah, yeah that, that, that's quite interesting. And when I was in Harvard Business School um, 20 years ago, and somebody presented a case study of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a country with all the ingredients uh, that, that, that ought to have propelled this country to develop country status. And uh, you know we couldn't believe it that it was uh, it was actually describing uh, you know one of our South Asian neighbors. Yeah. Uh, it's a very big country, uh, but I think if, if the, the commonality and I think uh, that uh, I think Korea, Hong Kong, and a few of us have is I think there's a preparedness to perhaps uh, try to understand and, and understand these dynamics about. You know, economic development. I think that's to last thing what Dubai is doing right now. So. Yeah, just going back to what uh, Professor McGowan mentioned, you know, we owe leverage on our natural resources, on oil, yeah. natural gas, in the 70s and 80s. But after that, we wanted to diversify our economy as much as possible. Right now, it's so much diversified that in 2006, our GDP, if you look into our GDP, mm -hmm. in 2006, only 3%. 3% of our mm. economy was contributed by oil and gas. That's mm. extraordinary, isn't it? Yes, and so that's why we had to, you know, we shifted completely now mm. from the oil and gas. So it just shows how differently you did it. They did it because they had nothing else. You know, mm. because you said we must have something else. Yes. This is when we, of course, the government was founded in 1986 when the price of oil uh, declined sharply mm. to reach $5 per mm -hmm. barrel. Right now it's $90 per yes. barrel. <laughs> Just imagine, you know, from that time, yeah. prompted the government to look into yeah. uh, diversifying its economy from yeah. 86 from that time. So but now, of course, it paid off, I guess. Yeah. But among the Emirates, uh, I, I would be correct in saying that your, your oil reserves are perhaps the most, uh, the most uh, modest among them. Yes. Uh, say, compared to Abu Dhabi, I guess, Abu right? Dhabi, of course. And perhaps that's, that, 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 is the, that is the spur, the like, motivation initially. Mm -hmm. Yes, they drove through your... You know, but they're the United Arab Emirates. <laughs> <laughs> you compete as well as United, right? when you say, Yeah, when you say the share of... Uh, you know, when they say share of the UAE in OPEC, that means share of Abu Dhabi, Emirate of Abu Dhabi mm. in OPEC. You know, not uh, Dubai or uh, Sharjah or other Emirates. So mm -hmm. that's one thing. Of course, they have huge reserves of oil and mm. as well as natural gas in the world. Tell us what, what's uh, been happening to the uh, uh, the education system in, uh, in Australia. Mm -hmm. How how is how how you keep catering now with this long period of sustained economic growth? Uh, well, in some ways, it's been interesting. The uh, the federal government reduced its funding. We had this extraordinary economic growth, uh, um, and the OECD's figures show that between 1995 and 2004. Um, expenditure on, ter on tertiary education, that's higher education, in, in Australia grew by 25%, mm -hmm. but student numbers grew by 33%. Mm -hmm. And sure. we're, we're one of only, there are only three, other, three or four other countries in the OECD mm -hmm. that increase their expenditure more slowly than they increase their student numbers, and they're poor countries. That's Portugal, Poland, and the Slovak Republic, and I forget the four. Um, but what's even more interesting is if you look at the 25% increase in, in expenditure in Australia, it, that was made up of a 7% reduction in government expenditure and an 85% increase in private expenditure. I see. Um, now, with an election coming up in three weeks' time, and just in the last two years, the, um, the government has been suddenly spending on higher education. They created a $6 billion, $6 billion investment fund for higher education. But that's after nine years of reduction in expenditure. I, I think the most interesting change, you'd be interested in this, uh, having studied in North America, um, is the University of Melbourne has essentially adopted the North American model. I see. Um, they've quite cleverly called it the Bologna process that they're following, which is attempts, Europe's attempt to adopt the North American model anyway, but it sounds more elegant to say it's Bologna. Um, 
but the university had 95 undergraduate degrees. And they said, why don't we reduce that to one? And the only undergraduate degree be a Bachelor of Arts in Science. I see. A, a general liberal Bachelor liberal of Arts in Science. Science. And then uh, that didn't come off, but they've reduced it to five. There are five degrees. There's a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Science, a Bachelor of Biomedical Science, a Bachelor of Commerce they've kept because 55% of their students are from overseas. And they've got a four, the fifth one is one that prepares people for architecture and agriculture, <coughs> that sort of land-based mm. and industries. And then all the professional studies will become graduate level. And uh, this is one response to um, gradually making higher education mass, a mass system. So they're <coughs> delaying the differentiation until after three years of university study. I think it's a good idea, actually. And um, um, the university's right in the middle of that change now. Yeah, a lot of changes uh, occurred, I'm sure, of right after 9-11. United States, of course, students wanted to, after, of course, 9-11, they were led to, of course, that led to uh, having visa restrictions and also immigration laws to the United States. So students uh, had to find another alternative destination, and uh, Australia was considered to be an ideal destination for them. Uh, the numbers, I mean, I'm, uh, I remember them very clearly. From 2000 to 2005, uh, the percentage of uh, Middle Eastern students going to Australia really increased to mm. a growth rate of uh, 88%. 88%. To Australia. Yeah, mm. four year period. And, so and right now, if you look into in terms of the having international students, almost 20% of the uh, students enrolled in the programs offered by the uh, Australian higher education providers are uh, international students. As opposed to the United States, they have like around 3.5%. Yeah, Australia has the biggest proportion yes. of their own student body. Yes. Yes. And in some universities, yes. it's more than 20%. Yes. And uh, this is one thing, you know, you see, you know, internationalizing their programs as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And they have been very successful. And they have been very successful in that. Well, it works if it's well done. It doesn't always work. I mean, sometimes there's, um, it's too much, they're just chasing the, the fees of the mm -hmm. students. but. But if it's well done, the local students benefit because the curriculum becomes internationalised. Mm -hmm. um, you can't teach business studies as though everyone before you is Australian mm -hmm. or going to work in Australia. They're going to work elsewhere in the that's world, true. and that's a good thing for Australian students. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I was an undergraduate, my first degree was in chemistry, and my laboratory partner was from Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I look back, this is 1950s. No, 1960s actually, high school was 50s, 1960s, early 60s in Australia. I don't think he had a really good experience of, it might have been a good experience at the university, but I don't think he had a good experience of life in Australia. If he came to Melbourne or Brisbane, as it, which is where he came then, he, I suppose even if he came to Brisbane, but if he came to Melbourne or Sydney now, he, he'd feel he was in an Asian city. He'd be surrounded by Australian Chinese, Australian Indians, as well as overseas Chinese and overseas Indians studying in the country. He didn't have that experience 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, your, your society has changed to, uh, to a very large proportion uh, today, isn't it? Yes, I mean, we're actually in Melbourne. I'm surrounded by a, a very vibrant Chinese community. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I agree with you. I think that, that if, for example, it's done, it's done well, uh, the, the student body is engaged, and, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and that's very important, I think, for the preparation for the world. Um, because I think in, in, every, in every area of work, one, one these days have to, can we do serious work if there's, there's a fairly you know, extensive collaboration with counterparts in, in many parts of the world. Uh, our, our companies, for example, in Singapore, I think to a very large extent in Australia as well, uh, even though in, you know, initial, you know, uh, traditionally we have been uh, drawing from our own people and so on, but the last ten years we've seen, you know, uh, many different nationalities working in, mm. in many of our companies, mm -hmm. you know. and and we are we are we are, we are quite, you know, we're quite different from them from Dubai. Dubai you had to right from the start, but mm. but traditionally we have always been drawing only on our own people, own people. But that that sort of uh, gave way eventually to the need to to, uh, to 
we have different nationals working in, in, in Singapore. Uh, I mean, I started my uh, this company uh, or remodeled it, not so much, you know, as as an investment platform for airports and airport related assets around the world. And I started at 25. Initially, 25 all drawn were all Singaporeans and Malaysians. But today, I have about 11 nationalities, you know, mm -hmm. Europeans, Australians. And, and, and that, I think, is a flavor of the kind of uh, companies mm -hmm. that we are seeing emerging, not, you know, even in you know, conservative Asia. Yes. You know? uh, and I, and I, I, think, I think that's, that's really you know, the kind of change that one mm -hmm. has to prepare our, our, our young people for. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not just to work with these people, but also to take advantage of the fact that, 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 that these different cultural backgrounds uh, sometimes bring very rich diversity of insights, I think, into problem situations which they should draw from. You know, this is what even yesterday yeah. I was talking about, that one thing is, you know, uh, right now if you pick any of the Fortune 500 companies, you know, they're looking to hiring someone who has that international exposure, working in a multicultural environment, more working in different environment, mm -hmm. they, uh, they will recruit them right away, you know, because this is what it is now. They want to make it as much into the company, as much international as possible. So right now, the international exposure, you know, even for faculty members, you know, when they go on exchange programs or when they go to these uh, programs uh, for the students, they have these exchange programs and inter internship programs. This would at least encourage them to have at least be exposed to these different cultures and uh, experiences. And this is where, of course, uh, all the companies and organizations and industry look into someone who has that kind of uh, exposure, of, you know, living somewhere else, you know, having that kind of uh, experience. So it is, yes, of course. Uh, now things have changed. It's not like us used to be. Now you pick, I uh, even read an article a uh, few months ago about, you know, attracting the uh, workers who have that kind of international experience and exposure. Uh, of course, uh, they found to be, you know, much, uh, easier to be recruited, you know, than others. Yes. You know, I read somewhere the Hong Kong Shanghai Bangkok Corporation in their, in their succession planning has uh, has issued this general kind of guideline that uh, they will they will not consider candidates for uh, for senior management appointments if this person has not had two tours of duties in in a different cultural environment or in a different setting from from from, from their home, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that that is going to be a very important mm -hmm. requirement. For, well, certainly because more and more companies become international. Yeah. I mean, the other interesting thing coming back in a way almost to the the way we started the discussion um, and reflecting on what you two have been saying in particular um, is the culture um, cultural differences mean that there's quite often a different a different basis of the growth trajectory I mean in your two cases much more government intervention than you would find mm -hmm. if you went to the United States where it's it's been the free market for so long that sure. um, mm -hmm. uh, you've got all this, so you talk about the institutions in Boston, they're all, many of them are private institutions. Mm -hmm. If you come to Melbourne, there's some very powerful research institutions, particularly in the medical area, yeah. but they're all essentially government institutions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with an increasing private element of support. So we're somewhere between. Now, yours has got much more private now, but it began... Well, increasingly changing the model as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's yeah. the interesting thing. I mean, yours started with a lot of government yeah. intervention, yeah. but that's changed. Yeah. We, we felt that there's the, uh, a more reliable way to make sure that institutions differentiate uh, themselves uh, uh, appropriately in, in, the, in the changing uh, you know, uh, dynamics of, uh, uh, of our business community. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, for example, I think we have currently now we have uh, three universities in you know, we are pop pop you know, serving a population of four million. But within these three universities, each of them would have several research centres, and some of these research centres are run entirely by by, by private sector institutions. Uh, uh, even though the government still fund to some extent their yeah, expenditure, but increasingly a lot of the uh, a lot of the operational expenditure, the research grants, have come from the private sector. Uh, Do you know for in US what the proportion of funding would be government? I think, I think today is, for in US it's still disproportionately government, you know, but the government has put in place a very attractive, um, a very attractive program whereby 
anyone who makes a, a donation, the government would, would match it dollar for dollar, and that's mm. that's the unlimited amount. All right. So we, we, we end up with a lot of endowments in recent uh, in recent years. Mm. Uh, someone, uh, uh, I think probably over the last five years, <coughs> you see perhaps a, a mushrooming of of, uh, of uh, endowment shares. Mm. Uh, uh, our music conservatory, for example, was raised entirely from from private funds. Um, but I think what is but it's a public institution still. It's still a public institution. Yes. Yeah, it's still a public institution. Yes. So we have not seen the birth of a of a, of a truly private university yet. Except, uh, why did you bring in the Wharton School? Yeah, the Wharton School. I mean, you had a powerful business school in Singapore already. Well, the idea is to is to encourage competition. That's what I understood. Uh, in fact, a long a long time, they used to be only one economics department. That's under that's housed under the National University of Singapore, and it was deliberately really decided that 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 we should have a competing economic school to offer a competing view, uh, uh, alternative perspective of the economy and so on. And, and, and that, that seems to be, to be fun. And so they, they, I mean they, yeah, the, rule, the rule of the game now is to, to have as many you know, um, competing um, viewpoints as we can, as we mm. can afford, given, you know, given our size. Mm. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, I think so this the final topic. The characteristics of the 21st century, the great challenge is the urbanization of Asia. Urbanization of Asia. Mm -hmm. This is a really grand scale and rapid scale. And then uh, in the Western world, 20th century, the uh, urbanization rate is 2% of early 21st century. End of 20th century, the urbanization rate is around 50. And then now, uh, urbanization of Asia is very rapid and grand scale. Mm. Before, uh, in Western world, urbanization is like uh, industrialization. And the urbanization is uh, from the existing city. And in case of Asia, the urbanization is a little bit uh, different from the industrialization. This is uh, something different. And then, uh, the style is new city, not from the existing city. So, this is a great challenge for Asia, including India and China. In case of China, uh, 15 years, they must build 3,000 Venetian scale new city. And then the challenge of the new city is very... Mm -hmm. uh, Green challenge for Asians. We talk about uh, two or three minutes. Some suggestions. Well, I, I I don't need two or three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know anything about um, the development of new cities. Or I mean, I, I've heard the figures that for the first time in the world's history, more than half the population is living in cities. Mm -hmm. um, but they and they're becoming very big aggregations in some places. But how you make it smaller? I mean, at a, at a much smaller level, one of the things I'm doing, having gone back to Australia, is working with a very large property developer, Lendlease, um, as a consultant, because they are interested in the education services hmm. that a new community should provide and how you organise those services so that they meet the learning needs of everybody in the community, not just those who are of school age. Um, how, how you ensure they connect with the economic needs of the community and its hinterland. Um, and, this is the interesting third part for me, how you might conceive the education services so, so they build social connectedness. Um, we had a meeting of OECD education ministers where the ministers said, you know, when I was young and growing <coughs> up, there were many things in my society that we all shared. That's mostly gone, and the only thing that we share these days is school. And I, I remember saying to the ministers, but that's not true. I mean, in, in most of our societies, schools, schools do not provide a common experience because schools separate. Schools separate mm -hmm. on the basis, which separates boys from girls, and not only in your culture, but in many places, boys from girls. 
it separates in our culture on the basis of faith. There are Christian schools, Islamic schools, as well as public schools. It certainly separates on the basis of wealth. Um, there are public and private. And, or even public schools in wealthy areas are different from public schools in poor areas, as in the US. So school is not common. The only thing that's common is schooling. Everybody experiences school. So the question is, can you have <coughs> schooling provide some kind of common experience? And what we've been working on in that case is finding new ways to have schools that are separate, collaborate. I won't go into details, but it's, it, it, it's, it's much more small scale than, than what you're talking about. But these are communities of um, new Greenfields communities of 35,000 people on the outskirts of a city. So they're, they're, they're not tiny, but they're not big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the unexpected boom that we have uh, yeah. you know, experienced in the beginning of the century, uh, you know, talking about the freehold properties and all, all came out. <coughs> now we, of course, a new area or zone has been created now, mm -hmm. uh, called New Dubai. <laughs> now there isn't any, of course, well, we have to segregate the two now, New Dubai from the old Dubai. In fact, I live, and I think, in the no man's land, in between, I guess. Uh, but uh, this is one thing we have to look at, you know, providing all the logistics, support. The government should provide the support, the logistics, mm -hmm. and also bringing all the shared facilities in order to make it, you know, livable, as livable as in the old city. But new city, of course, it has to reflect the modernization of the city mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, technology being incorporated, uh, concept, new concepts being incorporated. And that's what it is. If you go there to Dubai now, the new Dubai now starts from the internet city, media city, knowledge village, and going forward to Dubai land, like uh, Hollywood style uh, mm -hmm. zone, and many other zones uh, similar with a similar concept. Now, this is where it starts, the new Dubai. The old Dubai is where, where you see, I mean, the, the old Dubai with the old traditional markets, the people living mm -hmm. differently than what it is uh, with the new, uh, the freehold, the properties and so forth, as well as these new uh, organizations, different yes. types of companies been uh, set up there in uh, the new Dubai area. But uh, the government should play a key role in this, you know, providing all the support and logistics, and of course, providing these shared facilities in order to make it a uh, real success. Mm -hmm. The, but this is what, one thing I look at. But also same thing when you go to Delhi, for example, where I was with the taxi driver. He said, now you left the Delhi and now you are in New Delhi. And I don't know how <laughs> you you know, <laughs> Delhi, yes, you know, living in Delhi or being in New Delhi. So for us, it is now <clears throat> a clear distinction between the two here, where you have new uh, organizations, uh, all these types of innovation, creativity, and all been implemented in this new city. I would say new to buy. So you don't yes. have all the history, the culture, but you have the chance to make something yes, in new the, in other respects. Yes. So but this is maybe gives you that kind of distinction between yeah. the two <coughs> between the two zones. I would. Uh, and why do you live between them? Because you can't choose. Well, no, <laughs> no, I didn't know that I was, you know, living there. But uh, yeah, he's, a, he's a foresight. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so, we have anticipated to see, you know, such a growth, you know, and uh, things have been moving at an abnormal pace. Uh, a desert, uh, you know, seeing a desert uh, in, after two or three years, that desert is completely now changed to these industries, uh, companies coming in, commercial companies, and uh, new types of innovations uh, all been implemented and just in the desert. Mm. You know, in just a few years, I would say, you know, six, seven years. And even, of course, that will reflect on the price of the land in this case, you know. So that's one thing, it played a role. Now, Knowledge Village, where it's located, yeah. uh, it is in a premier location. If you go there and you see it, it's in front of Knowledge Village, there is the um, Palm Island, the first ah, man-made yes. island in the world, so the biggest man-made island in the world. So uh, seven, ten years ago, the price of land uh, there was around... Um, four or five dollars per mm -hmm. square foot. Now the price of the land over there in uh, Knowledge Village is around, I we'll have to do the conversion to five hundred dollars per mm -hmm. square foot. Okay, so that is in seven years time span, seven, eight years time span. 
so I've reflected sharply on that. So you mm -hmm. see, yeah, this is the difference. We're talking about the order of magnitude yeah. of two here, yes. Mm. Uh, I'll be very short, I think, in this <laughs> response. I think basically my sense is that uh, after observing some of the larger countries than my own, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, organize and, uh, and have responded to some of the challenges that you raise, this, yeah. this increasing urbanization. I think, I think basically the fundamental issue is uh, to provide reasonable level access to both jobs and education. Yes. And I think if the if there's in place a mechanism for that to distribute jobs, to distribute um, you know uh, you know access to education, uh, I think the pressures for organisation to will be will be to will be relieved to some extent. It may not be completely relieved because there will be other factors. But I think I think this probably these two are probably the most important. Uh, drivers of increasing urbanization, particularly in the Asian society. Yes. I ask myself, why do why do Chinese villagers want to go to Shanghai? Because the best schools are in Shanghai, the best jobs mm -hmm. are in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. right? And therefore, Shanghai, to a lot of villagers, promises this aspiration of a better world, of uh, a better life. You know? mm -hmm. So I think, I think, from the point of view of a country, even a country as small as Singapore, mm -hmm. we, we, we recognize <coughs> that um, uh, these, these are the two fundamental drivers of uh, you know, uh, migration within the, within the country, and and for that reason, we uh, I think we already talked about the education system, how 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 this should be accessible, how this should be open, perhaps to you know to people of the you know uh, different different nationalities and so on, but uh, but equally important is the transport system. Now, one of the problems I think to to some extent that India faces is that. They may have a world-class airport. They may have, you know, world-class education institutions. But you know, the, the 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 problems of getting to these facilities are so great that it it necessitates people coming down to Delhi, mm -hmm. people coming down to Mumbai, because there's no other way of delivering, uh, you know, uh, these educational goods, you know, or or, or these jobs other than uh, for people to be physically present in the in the place. So so I think uh, I think. You know, Professor, you, you touched on earlier on the issue of uh, airports yes. in relation to accessibility. Mm. And I think, I think that is the contribution that our, my sector, I think, uh, you know, presents mm. I think in, this, in this economic, uh, you know, debate. Mm. Good. Yeah, thank you. And then, finally, uh, this is the Chifu, and then Chifu is the birthplace of Kung Tzu. Yes. It's like... Uh, Mecca and Jerusalem, mm -hmm. not the Asia. And then, last 3,000 years, the population of Chifu is 30,000 around. Mm -hmm. And then now, they planned 50,000 new city. And then this is the style of urbanization of Asia. And then in case of Dubai and in case of Singapore, this is a national project. Mm -hmm. But it's one city, you know, one nation. It's a national project. Mm -hmm. And then, in case of China, like uh, Chifu, they must build 30 cities. This is a very special mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. And I show you. Mm -hmm. This is old Chifu. Last 3,000 years, they will continue the same scale. And now they build new one, rather than existing city. Right. Mm -hmm. Great challenge for Asian peoples. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This, uh, I think that's you, that's 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 you will discuss yeah. the more after this morning. Yeah. I visit your airport, and I visit <laughs> your <laughs> school, yes. and I visit your village, sure. and I'd like to discuss with you about Asian cities, new Asian yeah. cities. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's been very interesting. It's been very interesting to meet you too, as, as well as our chair. So we have to go down there. Yeah.